Okay, everyone, ready for our next session um, on stage? Please welcome from Public Enemy Chuck D and Seth Troxler. How you guys doing today? Hope you guys are having a really uh, nice conference. We're up here with the one and only um, Chuck D, one of the biggest musical influencers, I would say, of of anyone's time in this room. Um, I think we're gonna talk about a few things. We just met backstage, uh, and go, coming into this interview, I, I knew very little, uh, and I had a lot of questions about how the record industry actually worked, and coming from a scene that is so deeply independent and niche, I realized how little I actually knew. And I had a few questions for Chuck, and Chuck had a few questions for me. So I, uh, I yeah, okay, maybe there's some, some monitors would be cool. And I, uh, yeah, we're, and we're, gonna, we're gonna discuss some of that with you guys, and I hope this goes off really well. I have to say this is like the first time I've been nervous in my life, but Chuck called me down earlier, so uh, it might go okay. How you feeling today, Chuck? I'm good. Um, first of all, greetings to everybody, and I'm letting y'all know that Seth and I was backstage in the green room talking for three hours. So y'all missed the best shit back there. It, it's completely true. I was like, why couldn't they just record that? And then and it'd be done. At, at some point, I kind of like acted like I was eating a sandwich just to like save some good chat. <laughs> I was like, I could keep the banter up. So, no, actually the sandwich was delicious. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's start. Uh, we're here at IMS that has a, uh, a myriad of different speakers, uh, speaking of different things concerning our culture, well, b being electronic music and the wider music industry culture. And Chuck had a really great thing that, uh, he had a great quote that he said earlier when we were talking about music and, and the music industry. And he was saying, the music industry and the record industry are two different things. You know, and that was something that I find, I found really kind of like, wow, you know, because many people may not know that the music industry is often run by accountants and lawyers, you know, and Chuck was saying after the 70s, um, you know, when the music industry was run by creatives who were wild and crazy and messed everything up, accountants came in and, and cleaned up the entire situation. So it, 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 it kind of dawned on me that I feel very few people realize that the people who dominate the music industry and that put out the records of today are very different than the people creating the records and making their art. And Chuck, can you expound a bit more on this idea? Well, domination is never a great <laughs> term yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. when you talk about creativity and, and trying to share. Um, I was telling Seth, creative people are being creative and often when they're creative and, it, and the ball slips out of bounds, accountants and lawyers will clean up that corporation's day like it did in the late 70s. They were saved by the configuration changes of the CD. But I was telling Seth in the back, background, it, it, it's always, it's a careful dance. Creators and the people that's gonna make an industry out of whatever it is. I'm not jealous, but envious on the way that electronic dance music has organized itself, has been able to understand what it ain't as opposed to what it is. And I think that ball has slipped that slipped away from hip hop the minute that the DJs stopped having the majority of the say so or where the music should go. See, I come from a time back in the 70s where it was totally run by DJs. And if you happen to be an MC to get on the mic, your job was to enhance the DJ's performance. That was your job. Not even just tread water. You had to enhance it, which means that the DJ could have did it without your ass. It had to have, you have to have an exceptional master of ceremonies to enhance the DJ, and then it was time to get the fuck off the mic. <laughs> the minute that it became an industry, so to speak, well, you can't record a DJ, and that's pretty much documented in why Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, you never heard Flash other than him being a symbol, and you heard the Furious Five. 
because it got incorporated into a recording industry where they could record the voices over musicianship and yada, yada, yada. We could go on and on about that one. But that's when the MC started to symbolize hip hop over the DJ. And one thing I noticed by, by electronic DJs is that you guys ain't opening up the mic <laughs> to nobody and you're controlling the vocal. Like we got an acapella, we'll slide this shit in, we'll rock the house, not open the mic and take this the fuck on out. Maybe twice, maximum. <laughs> right, and, and, and I thought hip hop got sloppy with the ball in the 80s and in the 90s, then the corporations take over and then it, it's redefined as something else. And um, that's why I say I'm envious. Yeah. But I'm envious at the organization and the way that you guys stick together in some sort of loose union, which I've always been trying to fight for rap music and hip hop to have. Oh yes, you can see at the spreadsheets that it's profit over losses, it's made trillions and all that. But that doesn't mean that it's solid. That doesn't even mean that it's great. That doesn't even mean that it's best culturally. Something for the long tail that lasts a long time under its own rules and still going forward and grow with some growth, I think is important. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny you're also talking about a situation where uh, Chuck called it headache money or shirt money. And uh, there's a tweet of yours that uh, my father, who you met in the back, turned me on to. And you, you said, um, when I was in the record industry, I had to call the label every day and fight for my art. When I was in the major record when, when you're like, yeah, exactly, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I, when you're in a major record label, and, we're, and I was, and I brought up earlier when we were speaking, the uh, kind of responsibility of record labels, you know, because you're saying, you know, on an Excel sheet, things may look, you know, very good, but they're promoting music that is possibly not the best for society, you know? And today, many majors, I mean, my idea of a major and Chuck's idea of a major are, are very different. Because, I mean, just generally, sales are very different. But then Chuck turned me on to this idea of currency. You know, currency isn't only physical sales. And in our world, you know, let's say a very much underground dance music world, currency is the idea that, like, there's social currency. I mean, there's social currency between everyone in here. You know, you guys go out, you're doing, like, you know, meeting and greeting people, you know someone, like my friend here from Mixmag, he knows someone else, and it's like, okay, this guy, this guy knows someone else, and there, there is a social trade there. But m more to the point, I wanna ask you, you, Chuck, and about the artistry. Is it possible in today's music industry for an artist to ascend or come up speaking the same truth that you spoke in a industry today that is dominated by the idea of profit and loss rather than artistic kind of stability and in, in, in general? Of course. It depends on what you're listening to. It's a big world out there. Most people in the United States only count their one country and they only count what they're into. It's a different world than we were 40 years ago or 30 years ago where socially you were kind of like taught from the same elements whether it was in your neighborhood or abroad, because it was five channels to look at, few radio stations to listen to, and everything came through this cosine part. But for better and worse reasons, everybody's all over the place with what they pick and choose. I think that's a great choice if you're an adult and you're sure of yourself. Maybe less of a great choice if you're a person looking for yourself. So currency is paying attention in these present and future times. And I think the important thing is not what you sell, but how many people buy into you. And what, what is your, where does your philosophy go past yourself? Does it go into enhancing people checking you out? Or does it go into some kind of thing where you're trying to soak whatever they have into yourself? I mean, we or all the learn- the enhancement of culture in general. Enhancement of human beings. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna listen to you. Are you taking from me? Or are you giving something to me? If I'm listening to your song, what am I getting out of this? Even if it's fast food, do I get a buzz for a second, but am I feeling fucked up five minutes later? I mean, you know, you can spend time with somebody. Oh, I spent a great first five minutes, but the last 15 minutes with this fool killed me. 
Oh, Albert. this is a great opening to this session, this conversation between Seth and Chuck. But the last half an hour sucked. You know? So you want to be able to enhance any situation when you're using people's space and time. And the further we're, we're connected, we're webbed together, we're doing music, we're listening, we're, it, everything is part of the social atmosphere, then we want to make sure that culturally, culturally and musically, you can enhance people's movement. And I think that regardless of what genre you say you're into, or people better off than how they came in, so even in a performance, or you better off going to a spot coming out of the performance than how you came in without drugs or drink being part of the equation. Because they're going to always make you feel whatever they fucking meant to make you feel. But is the music a high? Is the performance a high? And this is why electronic DJs said, you know what? We can't let another genre interrupt our flow. Because the DJ has a flow, even if it's an hour, two hours, or three hours, that can't be interrupted with malfeasance. I have a question as well. Uh, yes. I, I, can, I mean, can, can, concerning this, okay? Mind so, if I take swings sometimes? Because I, I got, if I got a no, mic, you, you I got to. You got to come, yeah. But not at you, just <laughs> swinging. Out of the park. Practicing my bad. Cecil stance. Fielder. <laughs> okay. How's that? <laughs> that we got off. Detroit roots. I'm, 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 I was talking to. Seth's dad, Sherm, and we was talking about Detroit back in the day. I got grandparents from Detroit, seven mile around the corner from Pershing, and, and I always knew about the Detroit you know, music scene and, and the mixture of the house and the EDM and always respected how the rest of the world tried to ignore it and everybody said, we stick together. We're gonna make sure that you're gonna notice us and you're gonna acknowledge how we do things. I mean, Detroit's a funny situation. I mean, I, it's, I think a lot of the music that comes from Detroit, if you look at rock, you look at Motown, you look at techno, so much of that, I think, is people escaping a situation that is um, it's negative, you know? And it, like the only way a lot of arts come out is uh, kind of telling the story of the social situation that they were in. And Public Enemy, was very much, I think, built on that idea. Do you feel like artists today are trying to really tell the times of today? I mean, I heard this uh, great quote, I can't remember uh, the artist, but they were speaking, today we are living in very tough times throughout the world with war, with poverty, with social economic difference. However, musically, none of the music we're listening to really, effect, really reflects, or much of the music, I think that is popularized, not all music, because like you were saying, uh, in, in, my, in my own view, you know, is really reflective of the hard times that we're having. And when, I mean, me being much younger than you, and like my dad grew up with, with that scene, how were the times in the 80s and 90s when you guys were, you know, were, were rapping, reflective of the times of day? And do you feel like in a way that the same messages can be put out, or will they be kind of somewhat extinguished in the current climate of the record industry? And how music is kind of created, and how music gains popularity, not music gains popularity, but even displays in America? I'll be brief. 80s, <laughs> the 80s was, the 80s was R&B. That was Reagan and Bush. And, <laughs> snap. And as a black person, as a black person coming to the United States in the five year aftermath of what? Guns, crack, liquor stores, cocaine. No, listen, guns, crack, and, and you know, I come from Roosevelt, Long Island, which is a suburb outside New York. You couldn't find a gun in the town of Roosevelt, one square mile town, all black town. You couldn't find a gun in 1974. By 1979, when they took weed off the streets in 77, and all of a sudden it was cocaine, because they had the cocaine wars. And a lot of this could be documented when the CIA had something to do with infiltrating the drugs in the country, and it was you know, exposed on the Sam Mercury News, and, 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 and so on and so on. But the practicality of it, you couldn't find a gun, or you couldn't find cocaine in Roosevelt in 74, 75. 
all of a sudden in 79, it was like Merck cases, there was drug cases, and it was cracked by 1982, 83. All this was designed by to wipe out, it's just totally devastated the black areas in Los Angeles and New York in the beginning of the 80s, mid 80s, and by the time it hit Detroit, it's 86, 87, 88, 89, the drug. So it just was saturated throughout the whole 1980s. So the music had a few sources that you can actually access it and listen to. If it wasn't on the radio, Sony comes out with a Walkman. For the first time, you could take your personal song and music of choice and play a portable thing in your own head without, what, before if you have a boom box, it's like turn that shit down. So the, as social as you wanted to share with your music, it was like, nah, ain't it, everybody wanna hear your music. So S Sony Walkman, small headphones, doesn't mean that headphones weren't invented before, but the apparatus to play a tape into a small thing made everybody go into self-programming for the first time. Rap music and Self-programming. Yeah, of course. A really it's like, good. I'm going to listen to what the fuck I want to listen to. I don't have to listen through the radio. I don't have to listen to what everybody tells me I have to listen to. So for the first time, you had maybe a 14-year-old a kid who ain't waiting for the radio, who ain't got to stay home and play it on the turntable, a record player with their parents around. You ain't got to sneak it. Oh, I'll go in the backyard and zone out. It became a whole nother thing. Industry caught on to this, especially when it went from a singles medium into an album medium. So how to get your word across to infiltrate society was quite covert at that time. Public Enemy knew all about, it, all about that. We knew all about our history. I come from the 60s. I was part of the Black Panther lunch program in New York. I remember people that was already in the Nation of Islam. I remember assassinations of Dr. King, uh, uh, Malcolm X at five years old. I remember the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. I remember not having to go to school. So I ain't backlog. I had, oh, I got to research this. I got to Google or Wikipedia. I remember this shit. So by the 1980s, we just took things on total recall and did it in actuality to people who were born in the 70s that didn't experience the 60s. If I'm born in 1960, every single year of the 60s, I was a part of and recognized it from four on up. How could that not come out in lyrics? How could that not come out in the music? And like I said, in my group, I'm only the fourth oldest. You know, so there's everybody in my group understood that era. I was just able to put it in words, and we were able to put it in music, which was a combination of all types of music. We grew up with WABC in New York City which played everything. It was a pop station, but they played everything. And we knew that also black radio, WWRL, they had jocks that would sell you, they could sell you, they could sell you sand on a desert. They were so fly with their voices. So they were breaking records, but they also believed every ounce of what these records say. And these records also, did, they didn't pop up in the 70s like that. They came from the 60s because the 60s had a movement that made the artists responsible. It wasn't the other way around. Artists didn't make the movement. The movement made the artists. Kwame Torre, AKA Stokely, Ma Stokely Carmichael, if you don't know the name, Google it and shit. <laughs> he said, our asses was on James Brown so hard, he had to say, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. So the movement was already with the people and the community was more together to make sure that the musicians were in step or else they, they would get met, they would get dealt with. That was the truth of the black community in the 60s that we brought up in the 80s with hip hop and rap music. So we didn't invent anything. We just said, okay, this is how it was. In case you've forgotten or never ever knew, this is what you need to know and then brought it with our beats and our rhymes in our particular way. So we, we're curators of the music. And the music is nothing that just popped up out of nowhere the music has already been here. Rap music is not a music. It's rap on top of music. It's a vocal application on top of the music that's already existed. Saying that rap would disappear is stupid as saying, I wonder when these singing records are gonna stop. So it's rap, there's talk, and on the other side of that spectrum is singing. Rap is somewhere in between. It's a vocal on top of music. Now what EDM did said, you know what, man? We like the words. We like the vocals, but it's got to be in the flow, in the context of how we deliver it. That's why you guys are better off scratching in acapellas and saying, fuck the mic. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not really a representative of that EDM culture at all. Just, just, 
<laughs> let's just make that. Just make. The, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't. Know. I, I, I'll give you some music later, Chuck. But I, I mean, I'm much more collected with the kind of deeper um, artistic. Well, aspect. I just say electronic. No, 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 no exactly, every, exactly, every, exactly. Everything is electronic. Exactly. You know, I mean, unless you're, unless you're Joni Mitchell, you know, strumming a guitar acoustically, then everything is electronic. Because if you're doing a gig and, and the fucking power goes, then we fucked, ain't we? Game over. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of times in Detroit back in the day. I mean, I could yell loud without a mic. I'll get the cougars and all that shit. Stuff. I mean, often I think in a post-apocalyptic world, I would be useless. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy I'm cooking. <laughs> but um, one thing that I, like you, you were just kind of stating, and you were saying about the responsibility of artists, you know, you had a lot of uh, activists who were, on, you were saying in the 80s, from the 60s, who were on top of artists. And you were also talking about um, DJs breaking records, you know, and that's that's a huge thing, I think, in, in all of our cultures. Uh, I know I was talking to Pete Tong about it uh, recently when we were uh, at Coachella, and I played an old song, uh, Fat and Smalls, which, you know, uh, hey, what's wrong with you, looking kind of down to me, and, you know, th these, these were old records that really spoke up and, and said a lot. However, uh, earlier I touched on the idea of today's pay-to-play system and how a song, which actually the song very much offends me, um, I'm in love with the Coco, which literally, get, no, it, it literally gives society instructions to make crack, okay? This is the world that we're living in. In America, to get a record on the radio, you have to pay maybe like 100 grand. So you've got these record labels, you know, I actually, I don't know the real numbers because I, I don't work in that world, but I know, I know it's a lot. But you have these record labels that are choosing these songs that are played constantly on the radio that completely influence society. And, you know, for me, I, I was born in the mid 80s and, I'm and, oh, sorry, and grew up in uh, the 90s and the 2000s, really. And my stepdad is like a huge hip hop, like record geek, hip hop and R&B. But one thing I found growing up as being a young black male in the suburbs and having to constantly fight to be known as myself, you know, known as just Seth. I'm a Seth, I'm not like a young black male who's into crime and all these other things and meeting other friends' parents and having this constant prejudice or idea against me. I chose not to listen to uh, much hip hop because of the stereotypes that were portrayed about our culture, about black culture. And you said, like, uh, you know, th saying that uh, hip hop, like hearing someone to stop rap is saying, like, is like, when will people stop singing? But at some point with black music, the singing did almost stop. And corporations or record companies, in my mind, I mean, I'm asking this question because I wasn't there and you can shed a lot more light on it. But in my mind, it seemed like there was a shift in the record industry to only promote this music that negatively kind of portrayed black culture. I mean, before you had Motown, you had all this stuff that's really positive. I mean, you're saying in 77, there was no guns, but from 79 to 80, crack came in, partly from, the, you said the CIA, you know, and that, that is nearly a fact. And I feel like from that point on, they continued this cycle, you know, that now isn't only affecting black culture, but it's affecting social and socially economic lower um, kind of people, you know, basically. That becomes the uh, like uh, glorification of, of their world. But that glorification on the radio, and that is like pushed by these people, I, I really don't understand that. And having been there, what was the definitive change one, the music and our culture stopped being allowed to, like you said earlier, like to go, like, you know, everyone's making music, but Capitol Records right here and a couple other states, they have the bank. So how was it, even with you guys making music, at some point when things started to shift, was there a shift with the record industry of them being like, you know, actually the things that you're saying, we no longer want to promote and we want to say, we want to promote these other these other non-artistic, quick cash, you know, bad money kind of situations. I don't know if that's really a question as much as a rant, but. 
How much time we got, Seth? Let's cut to the chase. Uh, Michael Powell, when he was a, you know, he, him and Bill, Uncle Bill Clinton, you know, when they passed the Telecommunications Act in 1996, they allowed all these radio stations to kind of consolidate, get rid of the small local accountability and responsibility and have court plantations do their court plantationopoly and soak up two or three mega super radio groups to say it's a national thing, fuck local. So therefore, fast forward to 2015. Whether you believe in what I say or not, which is irrelevant to me, because I've been on, look, I've been on the FBI and the CIA list, and it's proven, it's fact, for 25 years. So like, I don't give a fuck, right? <laughs> when this was done, what it means is that your local acts that might come from Detroit, your local acts that might come from Wichita, could never be heard locally unless they sign with these court plantations in LA or New York. How many people are here originally from LA or New York? Duh. So you had to come to the big fucking mountain or here or back there to A, solidify your record contract with a corporation that's going to make you a national or an international star. Superstar. Thank you. And I'm not talking about your per se, but I'm just saying most of the artists that are this, these, these big, gigantic artists. They come to LA or New York, maybe Nashville and other genres, maybe. Maybe a new Nashville, which has a lot of independent power in it right about now. But I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying it is what it is. It's what makes it totally different than ever before because a local artist cannot ever be big locally. And when you talk about local business, if you, if you do a recording that you're able to do now, you're able to say, okay, I'm able to go into my own home studio, get on iTunes or get on my own you know, streaming service, get on Tidal, <laughs> whatever. I can't work the areas with people who are interested in me because it's only four of us and we, for us to fly to Seattle, where we got our biggest buzz, and we live in Germantown, Pennsylvania, we can't get to Seattle. We'll be operating at a loss. So the, the, the radio means a lot, especially in the United States. But that's been out of the con. That's been out of the, of the game for so long. There's such thing as headache money. You know, headache. Talk we about talked headache. about headache yeah. money. We used to throw gigs. So what headache money is like? We know that we could get this venue and pack this motherfucker out. But in order to do that, we got to get this act, and it might bring a fucking problem. And if it brings the problem, you got an incredible packed night. But the end of venue, and the end of anything else you want to do there. Sometimes you have to pay attention to your growth. How long can we keep doing these things? Oh, we got the event. OK, it, it brought in half the people that we, but it was still a success, profit over loss but we were able to continue to do things in perpetuity or as long as we see. We don't have headache money that made all the money on one night, but just killed shit. And this is how the record industry is ran. It's like, they bring in a person, they, they think, well, I gotta make the money because stockholders are looking at us. We'll do anything we can to make the money. We'll sell your mama. And we gotta understand this. Let's, look, let's be realists too. You can't cry over what it is that it's been that way before you was born. If you're here to do your music, you're here to do your scene, keep your scene tight. Keep your alliance with each other tight. If somebody explodes and say, oh yeah, oh so-and-so gets a gig, and every time he does a gig, he does it for $1.6 million, and every time I do a gig, it's for $350. So I want to get to where they're getting, and I'm not only envious, I'm jealous, so fuck him. <laughs> you know, you can't look at it that way. You got to look at your world, your core, your space, and make sure you never, ever, no matter what you do, spend more than what you get. This is an industry where people buy into you. It's a one by one. You can't get to a million before you get to one. And I think when it comes down to making art and making music, for the first time, artists have to look at this as artists. When you go to a gallery, anybody ever go to a gallery? You don't see 5,000 Annie Warhols up there on the wall at the same damn time. The person is trying to sell you a piece of art with a conversation and engaging you to buy into the artist. 
Once you buy into the artist, it's a one by one industry. Sure, they can have a stack of them shits in the back, but they only can hang one at a time. Now, you can have, you know, yeah, well, I got plenty of music, but your engagement has to count and really cherish what you got instead of like corporations think what you could have or prospect or this is what it can be or, oh, they downloaded, so they're taking shit away from us. You ain't had shit. So you gonna count what you don't have. You count what you have as an independent. You don't count what you don't have. That's the corporation way of thinking. How could we dominate the market and squeeze it out? I'm, I'm always pissed, but I'm a realist. 99% of the marketplace is controlled by the 1% that has everything in, in these two and a half major corporations of music, right? Just musically speaking, hip hop speaking wise even. You have 99% of the independents that gotta fight for the 1% that's, that's deemed for them just to make a living. I'm okay, but a DJ that comes up and says, well, I was DJ in 1983, and I actually was part of this recording process. How do I make a living? How does the hip hop DJ go out and do an event, and we keep a, a cycle of people like Cut Creator, or Terminator X, to do a gig that makes people come in and say, damn, I got, you know, I had a good time. Terminator X did the DJ. That circuit is yet to be solidified. We can look at the dance, DJ element is saying, okay, maybe that circuit is yet to come. Maybe it has to detach itself from the MC and have the hip hop DJ look at the blueprint that you guys made. However, at the same time, we're in a very critical period in our own job in electronic music. And you were talking about growth, right? We're in a stage of ex extraordinary growth, but with that, we're losing the underlying, the underlining element that made our culturally, our culture ours. You know that made electronic music independent. You know, and that is something that I, I think the reason that they put both of us on the stage together because neither of us really give a fuck. You know, and we try to keep, and we keep it real. You know, and 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 the thing that that really kind of fascinates me, and we were talking about hip hop, like when you listen to music or popular music today, I think there's very little hip hop that people, like when people are like, oh yeah, you do hip hop like Bobby Shimmerda, you know, or something like this, where people to me come up and they're like, or some people are like, oh, you're a DJ, like, um, you know, whoever, I'm not gonna say any names because I'll get in trouble. Like, uh, you know, like, uh, you're gonna get in trouble? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I got, I got, a, I got, a, I got, a, I got an MO for that. But, 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 but Seth, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Seth, there's a lot of people out there wearing L.A. Clippers jerseys and buying Adidas sneakers. It don't mean they ass is Chris Paul. So it's like they, you, you could buy the whole NBA fucking wardrobe. Your ass is a civilian wearing the NBA wardrobe. <laughs> Look, it ain't about the fucking equipment, although, you know, Pioneer, we can do something. But listen. <laughs> but we can do something. Listen. It ain't about the fucking equipment. Michael Jordan used to toss people the same goddamn ball and point to the same rim. It's what you do I'm not, with the shit, but the thing not is, what the shit is. The but thing, still, a lot of people's like, oh, I could do what you do. I DJ Seth, No, no, the thing, fuck is, the thing is not about equipment. It's about, it's about content, you know? And I think with hip hop, huh? Content, content, yeah. content, and I content think, and context. Con content and context, like art. Art is displayed in a, in a situation. Like art is only art in because of the context that it is displayed. That is the idea of contemporary art. You know, it's the the process or the thought behind what cr what makes it well, art. But no, 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 hold on a second, hold on, Chuck. So, so the the question that I'm I'm more that I'm really trying to get to was the point in hip hop, like. I want to know how you felt when growth started to overshadow content and that the point where you guys were part of a movement based on content and then that just like started to flow away. And I know for me, for, one, one, for a person trying to preserve my culture, you know, underground electronic music, I'm seeing people, like I'm seeing like actually mass culture further and further float away from the idea and the content that we're trying to preserve. And it, and it really pisses me off. Well, I'm not as pissed. Well, how much time y'all got? 
before y'all kick me out of this damn building. No, of course. It's, a, it's like we got an hour. Listen, listen to this. Um, the context, uh, the content, um, the DJ, the difference, the 80s. We played in arenas, same places where the fucking rock stars play. You know, Kurt Cobain is a younger peer of mine. He ain't like, oh, I got Tupac, a younger brother. So all these people that get glamorized and glor glorified and past their unfortunate death, they take on these different social aspects. But I was fucking there, and they was both looking at me and up to me. We played arenas, but we played arenas with each other. It didn't matter that we made movement music. Everybody was in accord with each other, from the MC Lights to the Big Daddy Canes to the Public Enemies to the Beastie Boys to the Run DMCs. That's we like played really deep the, content. Listen, Those are like but, amazing but artists. We, but we had different points of view, and we all played together. So when a hip hop fan came in in the beginning, and they left, they left with the total experience better than how they came in. The turn happened to be, it was like, okay, it's big, so where's the groups? We don't have groups anymore because the best way it works is that a label has to negotiate, or back with black artists, they gotta negotiate or renegotiate to have the individual instead of the group. Automatically, this is where it's practical. When you're looking at a group that's in sync with each other, it's a panoramic experience. You're like this. When they're in sync with each other, I don't mean 50 motherfuckers all with a mic screaming. Now I'm like, I'm talking about, oh shit, right? When the record companies start to negotiate these contracts, say, look, we want the individual. We don't want the fucking group. And the bottom line is what? Concerts went from arena to theater, went down to club, one person, yeah, they got an album, but after you see this album, we call it the 15 minute penalty. After fucking 15 minutes on a half an hour or an hour show, if them motherfuckers ain't fan unbelievable, there's no way one motherfucker gonna be like a group anyway. If they're not unbelievable, it's like, yo, this motherfucker better juggle lawnmowers, they better fucking breathe fire to keep my attention past 16 minutes. Rock bands play the fucking together, people. The bass, the guitar, maybe the keyboard, and the drummer, and the vocalist, boom, coming at you like, bam, Metallica walk into place, they scaring the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> when they went from we to a me and knocked it from groups to individuals, that's the first thing. It knocked the live element right the fuck out. It couldn't hang with other situations. Then since it's one motherfucker, and maybe they DJ, is the DJ in charge or is the MC in charge? If the MC cannot master the audience and control the crowd and be captivating, like I am on the mic right now. <laughs> Listen. After 15 minutes, it's a fucking rap. After a while, people say, I came in with this expectation and I left saying this shit sucked. Put 15 years on it, Seth. Fast forward to 2007. People got their gadgets. They could get more experience off their fucking gadgets and that's why their heads is at a 45 degree angle more than go and experience the thing. And then also fast forward to other musics. If like, okay, if the DJ can't control it and they're giving the credit to mescaline, then what the fuck is that? That's what I'm saying. Back in the day, before us, your ass had to be better than the high. People could get drunk all the fuck they wanted at the bar. The entertainment would blow you the fuck away. They could get fucked up, they could get coked out, cracked the fuck out. We played to all these clubs as, as DJs. We said our music and our captivation has to make a motherfucker say, yo, these mo I can't, I gotta put this joint down because I'm having a good fucking time here. I'll pick it up later. But these motherfuckers is tearing this fucking place down. And I'm saying you could tell a place that you're tearing it down, but you, when you're tearing a fucking place down, you're tearing it down. I'm telling you, those hip-hop artists in the 80s, when they stepped into a motherfucking place, they tore that shit down. And you know what? If you didn't, your ass was sent home, which was the worst place to go during a summer tour. Oh, yeah, you got the hot record. You brought people in. But really, seriously, your shit is whack. We can't put you behind these other acts. Because everywhere, and I would like to leave on this point, we used to call this shit the tour map of the United States, not even talking about the rest of the world. You know, we played 100 countries, and we smashed 100 countries still to this day. But you look at a market, either what? As a, as a, you put a balloon in each market. 
either you go to that market with helium or oxygen, blowing it up after your performance, or you go there with a pin, popping that shit. And once you've gone around the market of the world, you popping all the hype that you built up with a bullshit performance, your, your shit is out of there. Now, you might sell shit and all that, but nobody wants to see you. But fast forward where we at right now with my last note, we're at a thing where there's been compensation. There's been artists out there that sell in the millions. They start these companies. They, they're worth $300 million. Nobody seems to know how the fuck why. Have you seen them live? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen them live. Do you like their music? I don't know, but I, they're my favorite rapper. What's their favorite song? I don't know, but they're big. That, that shit's something else. It ain't got nothing to do with what this shit is. And that's bottom line. Bottom line, whether you're an athlete or an entertainer, DJ, rapper, singer, ventriloquist, whatever the fuck, if you come in better than how you leave, it's a fucked up diminishing return. I don't give a fuck what you do. Oh yeah, they all came in, they was hyped up. They went to the bar, they was pumped up. And how did they leave? They left kind of like, ah, it was a whack crowd. No, the crowd wasn't whack. <laughs> you gotta work on your shit. That's what it, what it is. You in the entertainment business, and we're, we are all less entertainers than 100 years ago. We are less entertainers than what P.T. Barnum had to pull out in, in a broke ass, <laughs> in the broke ass 1880s and shit. Oh, there's the lady with four heads and, oh shit. I only had four cent. And I spent two to go to the goddamn circus, and I will see those motherfuckers again because I can't even explain any crazy shit I saw. It's the same thing it was in hip hop's beginning. You couldn't explain all the things that were going on. The elements, DJing, MC, dance, and graffiti. Those are the elements, which are basically the elements of entertainment and musicianship, like artists, music, vocalization, dance culture, and art culture. They've been around for the longest strands of time. There ain't nothing new, just new names to it. Somebody's gonna come in and they say, I gotta get, now it's even more pressure. I gotta get more entertainment out of this time that I'm paying, not just my money, I'm paying with time, and this shit gotta be better than Netflix. And I could get Netflix right in the palm of my fucking hand and watch House of Cards. <laughs> Yo, you've got to, be able to fight for the attention, which is the currency of now. It's not how many people are buying Seth Troxler records. No one buys my records, by the way. Listen, listen, it's not about, it's not about how many, it's about how do you get into the dynamic of the person that's buying into you one by one, and how much time are you spending one by one with these people? And a final note, and thank you, Chuck, actually, that, that said, there are so many parallels of what you were saying, of the many points that I actually am trying to make, you know? Can't be whack. Huh? Can't be whack. Can't be fucking whack. <laughs> you can't be on a stage where every DJ plays the same exact sets. Like, one of our things in underground dance culture, we, oh, we bring the fucking noise, okay? It's about taking people on a journey. That is the fundamental element of our culture. I don't sell records, Chuck. You know, what I do is people come to my show and I create a positive uplift. I'll give you some of my music. It's very different than I think what you might imagine or what you may know as EDM culture. You know, like, when, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. And no, 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 no. No, 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 and, it, and it's like this, it's like this, you know, it's like, it's like you, you said, we pump it up, we're pumping it up. Underground culture has been pumping this balloon for over 30 years, and now people are coming in, you know, not bringing it, and how close are we to, how close are they to popping our balloon in all these different markets? And that is the conversation that I'm always trying to make aware you know, and I'm, I, I, like, I'm in the media for like, you know, like, oh, Seth says something else again, do do do, post idiot. Like, it's not, it's not about that at all. It's about the idea of, like you said, like hip hop was MC, graffiti, you know, um, DJ, you okay? Yeah. And dance. Underground electronic music is art, okay? Fundamentally, it's based off of art, you know, contemporary art, culture, dance, and real music. If you look at EDM, how many of those cultural standpoints are the same? You've got people coming 
It's a large stage like Netflix. I got to be better than Netflix. I'm going to have fireworks and this, but the content of the music that we represent is not the same, you okay? And that is the main fundamental point, you know? And that's the point. That's why Chuck is here, here today. I mean, Chuck created something. But if you look at hip-hop today, it's not at all reflective of, of, of that, of art, you know, culture, MC, and graffiti. It's just like, it's like this thing that, and then I think EDM and electronic music are in the same kind of dialogue completely. And, and actually, we're both here in complete agreement in many ways. Like, you know, Paris is the capital of France, you know, type, yeah, type but of situation. But you're, but you're not going to put the brakes on the world, Seth. You just have to make sure your vehicle is as unified, as strong as possible. The world will have all kinds of things that will pour on your parade. You, you got to, you, A, you still got to live your life, and B, or maybe it's A, you got to live your art and make sure that, you know, you I mean. To live your art. Well, well, look, it's like, I think simple, simple things count, like do one to others as you would like done to you. So if your Rule art, number one. So your art, you know, your art could be like, okay, this is how I feel with my art and this is an honest reflection of me. Or sometimes people are like, you know what, my art is basically the way I like to be treated. I like to be stretched over coals and, and tortured. So therefore, if what's going to come out of me, I want to torture you. Cool. As long as you admitted it, let's get that, that, that let you sign it right underneath your avatar, <laughs> you know? But I just think that, that we have to expect that the world will take on all kinds of whatever it is going to be. It's, it's, it's life of the world as it always been and will continue to turn. The biggest difference is from 25 years ago, you've had new people that have come in, so you can't go to them and say, don't you all know that? Or, you know, you ain't got no common sense. Sense used to be common. Now it's common nonsense. One thing that's common is people are engaged looking at 45 degrees into their Apple or their Samsung, no matter what it is inside of it. How many people got a smartphone on them? Put, it, put your hand in the air. Don't be shy. Come on, talk like, to me. It's a like whole room. Come on. The whole fucking room. 12 years ago, these hands wouldn't have went up. You never had any fucking idea what you would do 12 years from there. Now, many of you don't have any idea what you're going to do 12 years from now. All I'm saying is just try to comprehend in the space that you're in to strengthen your core and strengthen your core audience, strengthen your core alliances. If you make art and you make music, make something to reflect yourself. I think the best movement it's something for us as human beings to understand that we can work and live together. You're always going to have adversarial points of view that's going to be individual and say, fuck that. And fuck what you're saying, Chuck. And who the fuck cares, you know? You're always going to have that. But you don't go around, although, although people today, they do. It's like, well, do I look nice today? Fuck you asking somebody else how you look. But we have a new generation, two or three generations, that have come in and are looking for acceptance from all kinds of places. They're new people. And old people have moved on, even if they come to our understanding of what racism is, how we should live in a society, what country you're aligned with, what you're gonna fist pump to, what anthem. You know, you've had older people move on and younger people move in. Now you can't ask a young people, damn, don't you know this shit? You stupid because you don't know. They don't know. Because the social teaching that was once in, in my environment and your dad's environment, environment has dissipated. Well. And it's a different social teaching right here and now. Now through gadgets and ISPs. So the teaching has to kind of like be ever present. If you could do it with art, man, you know, it's a step to a better world. I would leave you with this one note. Make sure your ass is so dope, though, that you're better than the fucking drug at the gig. Because if you're worse than the, f hey, look. If your shit is all right, the drug, the dr drink is gonna win. Ah, how was he? Ah, that's the drug that got your ass, not the fucking music. <laughs> Be better than the drug of choice. That's bottom line for any entertainer. I ain't condoning what adults should do or whatever. But as a musician, as an artist, as a DJ, as an MC, you better make them look at your ass as the ultimate high. And that is the final word. Email. My, thank my, you, Chuck. My email, thank you, Seth. Thank you, thank my you. My email's simple, because I ain't got enough cards, but you can get me on Twitter, at Mr. Chuck D. 
It's my only social network on media, but although my social media guru is uh, Rinda Laurel has straight me out for years, but I, I made a rule. Once over 50, one social media. <laughs> from, <laughs> I know she hates when I say that, but I only could do Twitter, but I'm not a twittier. And my email's simple. I've had it forever. Chuck D at publicenemy.com. If you don't remember that, then you don't need to have it. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, fuck it anyway. I can understand you. It's about your opinion. It ain't about my opinion. Thank you. Thank we you got, we got. Thank you, thank you. I think we, we, we have got time for a couple of questions. Have we got any questions from the floor? I'm sure there's gonna be some. Any questions? Okay, a microphone, Sky. Chuck, Chuck. Hey, Chuck, so uh, congrats on the uh, victory over Universal Music the other day. Uh, I don't think it would have happened without your voice, obviously. Um, question for you. It seems like every week, if not every day, there's another story of a white cop killing a black dude. And the other day, I'm sitting with my 12-year-old daughter, and she says, why does this keep happening? And then she asks, how does it stop? It feels to me like, as a country, we're on the verge of some real serious social, racial shit, and I'd like your perspective on this. I don't think we're on the verge of no social, racial shit. I mean, <laughs> I mean, already there's been a whole bunch of people looking at themselves as human beings differently. What you had technology come along ever since Rodney King documenting the actuality. That's changed the entire turf here in the United States. It won't work in some countries. Some country to be like, oh yeah, yeah, you took a picture, we're gonna chop your fucking head off anyway. I, I, I think that these signs are something for people to be able to get rid of all the hype and the bullshit about what they think rape, post racial <laughs> United States is. Number one, calling it America is derogatory in itself. This is the United States of America. It's one out of 214 countries. I think the, the, the key for, especially musicians and artists, be beyond your, your, your nationality, be beyond your flag and your anthem, be an earthison. Because once you call yourself a, I'm an American citizen, it's a derogatory as hell to the Canadian, the Mexican. That's America, South America. That's, you know, it's just become and gel with human beings. And so I think what's happening is people's leaning towards what kind of human being should I be versus what kind of citizen should I be? These are the, the things that are now back and, back and forth and people are questioning that. So I think once again, making it relevant to this conversation, what does music do to that, bringing us together? What does music do to enhance us as human beings? Does it enhance it? Does it further put up divides? I mean, I, I first came in the 80s during what, Reagan and Bush, the 1980s, to say we we're human beings too, as black people. Don't treat us like anything less, we're human beings too. And all that vitriol, <laughs> and that piss and vinegar I put in the rhymes and all that, and the way I talk, you gotta take that too, because that's looking for compensation so you can rec recognize in us coming up. I don't, I don't buy into things and stupid shit like, oh yeah, well, Nigga, the N word is a love word that's now part of American vernacular. Says fuck, who pressed the button on that? Says fucking who? When somebody comes and tells me that, I look at them straight in the face. Okay, you think so, right? Who taught you that? Who told you that? Well, you know, I'm just saying, uh, yo, I mean, Jay Z records and uh, get, <laughs> I tell people, I say, all right, if you think so, you believe that, who taught you what you believe? Well, you freestyled information? This ain't no freestyle. So, that's that. Okay, another question. Down here. I got uh, two quick questions. <clears throat> so um, you said that uh, James Brown uh, came out in the eighties and he was just part of the movement. He didn't. He wasn't the movement. He was part of the movement. Do you think that the movement kind of gets in the way of the art and the music? And I mean, in, in today's society, do you think there is still that movement to where if they don't follow the movement, they are shunned by this, the culture and the society? Number one, movement is that you gotta determine what the movement is. You had a situation in the 60s where black people as a social category wanted to be respected 
as human beings. That's why the Civil Rights Act went into effect. So that was the movement. Because black folks wasn't considered being equal under the, under the law of the United States of America. That's why you had the Civil Rights Act in 1965. That was the movement. Just because it was signed, documented, clear it in 1965, doesn't mean that the movement did not exist asking for other things by 67 or by 1968 with Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud as a record came out. I'm a case study example. 1960 is my birth certificate, right? Negro is on it, right? Who the fuck came up with that? By 1965, I was considered colored because we used to look at shows like The Dating Game or The Newlywed Game. You say, oh, we hope the colored couple wins. We were colored, not Negro. By 1968 and 69, James Brown with the song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, turned that vernacular for a whole nation of people from colored to black. That's what culture lent, in, lent into it. So I went from Negro to colored to black in my first 10 years. How do you explain that? Okay? And because James Brown, everybody, and then by 1969, black was beautiful. And not only did black was it beautiful, and Julia was on TV, and she was a black nurse, and Bill Cosby's first show, he was, you know, he had his own variety show, and Flip Wilson, black was beautiful, and it fit in with Woodstock, with Sly and the Family Stone, with their multicultural band, took over and rocked the damn house. It was all beautiful by 1969 and 1970, so that was the movement that was enhanced by music, but also bled into social cultural movement of just trying to free itself from the chains of old school Eisenhower 50s United States of America. I mean, I come up in another generation as well where for me, we went away from being black and proud to back to calling ourselves niggas. And that is actually, I think, a larger problem with society today in the only way that a black person can be in a TV show, portrayed in a TV show, or in music today, is in a very negative light. And that is a fact, you know? So it's kind of funny that you were in this situation where we were propelling ourselves upward. Then, I mean, we hit a, a point with kind of popular culture and the responsibilities of media and the record industry that it started to create a new idea of who we are and who we're trying to represent ourselves as. I mean, the fact that ev I went to go, I went to this amazing concert recently. It was uh, Puff Daddy and Snoop Dogg, right? And it was like this big thing for Revolt and they had like everybody in hip hop ever, you know, like ever. It was like, like ever, you know? <laughs> and I mean, it was funny because this guy, he was doing this, he was doing this, um, this like a uh, stand up before. And he made, he made the, some really great points where basically this new idea of ignorance is so popular, you know? And, it's, and, and also we say, and who's pressing the button to release this, you know? So the guy, someone behind the scene is pressing the button to say the only records that are coming out from black people is black people calling each other niggas. So that's another, that's a whole nother debate you know, really. So it's like, all right, you, you're talking about like, all right, do people gotta subscribe to a movement? At one point there was a movement, but right now it's just this popularization by a corporate company to create a society in the way that works for them, that works for their system. And that's my, my personal opinion. I have an opinion. You know, this is, this is not fact, this is not data by anything, but if you look at society today, it very much so seems that this is what things are about. That's why I started this label Tuskegee with the Martinez brothers. I mean, I am not a racist person. I, I think I have the waspiest girlfriend on the planet. But the fact that there are no, uh, uh, like house music, house music, disco, hip hop, you know, came, came for this, was people in urban areas, Hispanics and blacks playing disco records, speeding up, having parties. Now today, if you look at, uh, if you look at Detroit Techno, all, all black artists, you look at Old House, today the amount of people of color who are in electronic music is so minuscule, you know? And they're, 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 there's a perspective of coming up in an environment of being, an eth of being ethnic, of being in a minority, you know? So it's like, it's, there's so many different layers you can really put on this whole discussion 
But there are, and this guy over here, he was saying some things, and you have, you have a different view. But I understand, I think we are in very troubling times, not only with black and white, but with all society. I mean, if you look at Islamophobia, you look at what's going on, you know, in the Middle East, you know, with, with either Jewish or like whatever. People today, I think we're taking steps backwards in social equality and what the civil rights movement was because no one's speaking up. And everyone wants to be PC. You've got this radio shows. You've got fucking television that are lying, lying to your face. We are in California that's having a huge drought. I was in Palm Springs yesterday watching a golf course be fucking like, oh, oh we don't, we're not allowed to use water? Palm Springs, there's a fucking fountain, okay? There's like, they got the, the sprinklers on. So it's who's running your life? What, are you, what movement are you starting? Who are you about? And that's the only way that we're going to change anything. If we start taking the responsibility ourselves, like in the civil rights movement, and speaking up, you know, not only for our music, but generally society. And that is, that's, that's, that's some real shit. That's, that's, that's a movement. Nick, next question, or you got one more? I think we should pass the mic on, sorry. Uh, Seth, this one's for you, and uh, Chuck D, you can get on this one too. Um, as a black kid who grew up in West LA, um, who had a lot of white friends, I grew up in a household that was um, listened to house music, but you know, I didn't hear about house until I got to high school, and like white kids were listening to it. So how do you, how do we get house back to its black culture and its black roots? And do you think that will help uplift black people as a whole in general? Because I think it would. I mean, there's a really uh, great thing happening right now, which is, which is, uh, this is amazing. I had, I had the same situation. I, I mean, I was talking to Chuck about this earlier. Growing up as a, a young black male, you know, whatever, there was many stereotypes I had to go for. I remember when I was a kid in our society, listening to house music, instantly there's a connotation that you were either gay or into drugs. But if you look at real house music, you go to the shelter in New York, this is like going to church. So right now in South Africa, Okay, you look at Black Coffee, and he's inspired a nation through positive music, no drug use, and it's taken uh, people who are, you know, you know, you know you, I mean, you know, black culture in, in South Africa, you know, post apartheid, and it has given them so much spirit. So I think all it is is giving people the context or some idea where they can relate. Like, obviously, nobody into hip hop or black culture is going to relate to Avicii. Yeah, that's just not gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? Like the, you're like I know our, our culture. They like, like what is up with this fruity ass shit? You know, people. Yeah, this is how our culture is. You know, and it, the real point I think to exposing people not only in black culture or let's just say urban culture is finding a way where they can identify and understand that there's some depth to our music. You know, urban or ethnic cultures often identify with deeper musics that have something to do with the struggles that they're facing. And I think house music, or real house music, there is a, uh, it uplifts people. You know, there, there is that musicality, there's the polyrhythm. You know, that really is something that's identified within our cultures. So it's just a matter of exposure. Really, and I think young black people or young urban people, because I think the idea of black or Hispanic, it's, it's really now become a class thing, you know, and, and like, you know, no matter what, if you're, if you're a ginger white guy and you grew up in the ghetto, you're still facing the same struggles, you know, and that's, that is Detroit, that's like, that is East LA or however it is, you know, it's just about social economic and people being able to understand that that is accessible. Me and the Martinez brothers talk about all the time. The Martinez brothers, they're from, um, they're from uh, the Bronx, right? Them and I both, without house music, would not have had all these incredible opportunities to speak. I'm, I'm up here with Chuck D. Like, I, I've never, you, you guys know me as a cocky, like outspoken son of it. I've never been so nervous in my life. Like, I nearly had a panic attack earlier. My dad drove from Phoenix just to, to, to see this. And this is like, that, it, it's like possibly one of the crowning moments of my life to be able to be up here with him. And it, it, it's so crazy to me that people are exposed to both sides of our culture. Like, many times Chuck came up with a thing, like, no matter what drug you may be on, da 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 But I don't think people understand that our culture, underground electronic music culture, is not about drugs, you know? It's about a society, it's about a group of people together, no matter what culture you are from, 
enjoying a music in a shared experience without glamour, without lights, without anything, in a small room, sweating together, and realizing that we're all the same. We all like the same things. You know, so there's, I mean, it's just, it's just exposure, and it's about the people pushing the button and us taking the responsibility for the people who are pushing the button to change. Can I ask you a question, Seth? Well, one quick question, Mia. How is it when the people at the top of the genre, do they treat the total genre with mentorship and respect? Like the, the guys at the top of the food chain making the big money. Yeah. How do they treat the ones that's coming in and the ones that's toiling in their own realities, and are they helpful or hurtful? Because that's that's the ball that also slipped yeah. away from hip hop. They got their upper tier, but they seem like to let the bottom half just all go by the wayside. So hip hop is a discussion of what you see on TV and the rich lifestyles of the rich and famous, where before it was about the headliner being able to encourage the ones coming in and mentoring them. I mean, that is something that's been, that's, that's the difference between EDM culture and underground electronic music culture. In underground and electronic music culture, we have great people like Pete Tong over here, who has been breaking records for as long as electronic music's been around. And in electronic music, in our scene, it's kind of a good old boys club. If you are real and you are doing things and you are like, you know, not an asshole, and then you are, you're, you're respected within our culture, you know, like everyone's like a big family. However, in the more commercial EDM scene, I, I, like these people don't even really talk to each other. I mean, a couple times I've played at festivals and I was just trying to get on stage five minutes before my set and see if my setup was okay. Let's say EDC. And I got thrown off the stage, you know, thrown off the stage by these guys who've been DJing for like a year or like these other things, you know. But you got people like Sven Voth and Pete. And, you know, Ben Turner, who are really pushing our culture, you know what I'm saying? We're all right for time, actually. So any more questions with Seth or down here? Thank you guys both for, for coming down. Um, thank you. Well, talk, it's an honor talking to you, Chuck, um, well, both of you guys. Um, clearly, you have a lot of criticisms and complaints, which you should, and it needs to be heard. I'm glad you're saying it. Um, but I want to hear what's good. Who are you, what's good? What are you guys happy about? Who are you both feeling right now music-wise? I'm curious, I wanna know. First of all, we have rapstation.com. I've been doing radio shows to curate, you know, the local artists, the global artists, the classic artists who are still recording today, the women MCs and DJs who are involved in hip hop. None of these aspects get made, and also international, I should say. There's, there's 200 countries spitting and doing the thing. We, we cover it well at rapstation.com, rapstation, the internet network. Nobody curates like we do. We service thousands of MCs, DJs, people that's involved in hip hop and rap music. So I'm filling all of them. I do a top 50, we do a top 50 every, twice a month, top 10 every week, and I've been consistent with my radio show. So from the Kendrick Lamars to the Craig G's, to the, you know, to, to the Dreads of Black Sheep, to Art Odyssey. I mean, I could name a, a trillion artists that I'm turned on by. And also with me, I think art is subjective. Everybody has their taste of what art is. But, you know, when you're taking it all and you're curating it all and you see which voices are being able to, to curate a different way, you know, we service it all and we allow the person that's trying to figure out how to get their spit in we help them as much as the guys that's got their major contract deal. That's what I'm feeling. Rapstation.com, get the free app. We got 10 station channels. Nobody does it better than fucking us. And I'm the motherfucker to sign my name next to it. Simple as that. The buck stops there. Hey, yeah. Uh, for me personally, I mean, I feel like right now in electronic music or underground electronic music, there are so many amazing young artists and small record labels releasing maybe two, three hundred copies, putting out some of the most phenomenal music. I mean, you can look to sources. I think there, there are some very credible, uh, I think, electronic muse sources that are very much in, in, in step with the times. Mix Mag being one of them, and Resonant Advisor. I mean, every day, you, you look at these magazines, you look at the, the reviews, and the people who are writing those reviews, especially with Mixmag, are people who've been in this scene forever, and, and actually making a very dedicated 
like view of our culture as a whole, you know? But really, with a more of a focus on underground electronic music culture, I mean, if you look at sales, Mixmag would probably sell a lot more copies if they were covering EDM. But they're not. They're trying to preserve what we're about. I mean, you look at Pete Tong's show. Pete breaks a new artist and a new track every week. And those are all, like, some of the best tracks in the world that are real. And, you know, I mean, for me right now, there's a lot of people doing it for me. For me, I think the Martinez brothers are some of the most talented up-and-coming artists in the world. They just made the new Chic single with them. They're crazy in the studio. But there's some kid probably just out here right now making some of the deepest music that none of us will ever heard. Ever, you know, hopefully we can hear, maybe we'll find it at a record store in some bin and you find it and you're like, what's this record with a stamp on it without somebody's name that was made by some 18 year old kid in Lithuania or something, you know? That's, that's exciting to me right now and that's where we are really spoiled, where we have this independent culture where people can find new music constantly. So, I mean, like Chuck was saying, Art and music is very subjective, and I have one of the biggest opinions on music. I mean, I, 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 I get, I, it's, it's horrible, you know? Like, <laughs> 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 having a music conversation with me is just like, I'm just like, ooh. I mean, it's not the music my girlfriend likes. I'm like, I'm like, I love that you love it, baby, but in my mind, I'm like, I, f I fucking hate this stuff, you know? But, you know, I, I'm tolerant. I'm like, I'm cool, you know? It's just when it gets to, like, a situation where people start to become the representatives of our culture that I become annoyed. But yeah, just get into what you're into. It doesn't matter what I'm into. It matters what you like, because <laughs> you listen to it. You know, I mean, it's like what I listen to is, I mean, I really like folk music and noise. Sometimes I listen to white noise because it actually is pleasurable to my ears. Just like, <laughs> I like, and like, yeah, see, I, 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 it feels good. It feels good on my ear. You, want, you like white noise? <laughs> no, I mean, that's like crazy, you know, but it's subjective. So yeah, I think the choice is really up to you. I think that's yeah, a, a good place like, to finish. It's like oh. AM radio, man. I, I love the sounds of a, old AM radio. And I get in discussions with my man Raul about it all the time. I like 60s AM radio with the shh. <laughs> I don't know why. So, enough of me. Okay, Seth Chuck D, thank you.